Good evening, everyone. South Hampton Synagogue, in partnership with the United Synagogue, is delighted to present our next episode of Formidable Jewish Women. Tonight, South Hampton member Lord Lawrence Collins of Mapesbury, former Justice of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, will be interviewing Dorit Bainish. A big thank you to South Hampstead members LB Norman Lebrecht for facilitating what promises to be a fascinating conversation. Lord Collins will introduce Dorit Benish in a moment, but before doing so, let me invite you, the audience, to post your questions during the interview in the live comments box, which you'll see on the right-hand side of your screens, and time permitting, we'll turn to some of them a little later. But for now, over to you, Lawrence. Thank you, Shlomo. It's my real pleasure uh, to introduce this conversation with an extraordinary distinguished personality. Uh, in 1989, Dorit Bainish was the first woman to become state attorney in Israel, which is roughly equivalent to a director of public prosecutions here. And six years later, uh, she became a justice of the Supreme Court of Israel. In 2006, she became the first woman president of the Supreme Court, several years before Brenda Hale became president in the United Kingdom. The Supreme Court plays an influential and dynamic role in Israel certainly more than the United Kingdom Supreme Court plays here, and possibly even more than the US Supreme Court plays in the United States. Uh, she reached the mandatory retirement age in 2012, but she's been very active since. She's taught at uh, New York University, where we were colleagues, uh, and she's recently become uh, Chancellor of the Open University in Israel. And what I'd like to do is ask her a few questions about her life and her judgments, uh, and hope that you will have some questions to ask at the end. So if Dorit can go on screen, that's working. Good evening, good evening. Thank you, La Lawrence. A dear friend and colleague, Lord Lawrence Collins. A good evening to everybody. Good evening to Rabbi Shlomo Levine. And I think, and thank you for this introduction, which is, Really, thank you. So kind, so kind. So I'm ready. You can ask me questions <laughs> and I'll try to answer. I hope I have the good answers. I'm not sure. Please well, go ahead. Let's start at the beginning about your early life. Tell us about your parents, where they came from, and what influence they had on you. Oh, they have a tremendous influence, of course. Parents always, and mine especially, I believe. Well, I was born in Tel Aviv. And uh, my parents came to then called Palestine before the state of Israel was established in 1933. Both came from Poland. They came because of Zionist motives. They were both very active. Uh, my mother in education in, po in Poland, trying to bring Hebrew language and Hebrew culture there in schools and kindergarten. This was her profession and my father was a Zionist socialist at that time and uh, really with a Zionist movement. They both came just because of their uh, ideology. Uh, at that time they left their parents, their families in Poland. My father managed to bring all of them, which means my grandmother and grandfather, to then Palestine to Israel. My mother didn't, and her parents, she went to bring them. They thought they would be a burden. They didn't see what is going to happen in Poland and in Europe. So my grandparents, my mother's parents, were murdered uh, by the Nazis during the Holocaust. So did her younger sister that stayed with them. And our family was established here in Tel Aviv. This is the background in a nutshell. And uh, I think that the time that I was born, which was really in the dark days of the Holocaust, and the atmosphere, and the idea of bringing immigrants, survivors here to Israel in the early years of the state was a mission that both my parents saw as their mission among others like them, pioneers. And we were an open house for survivors, for people who needed advice, who needed help, 
uh, and uh, every assistance. It was a very, from the social point of view, a Zionist open house, a part of the those who really were took part in building this uh, country and the ideal of the Israel state. That's my personal background. <laughs> Did they influence you in your in your um, choice of career eventually? No, actually not. A few things. First, I didn't say my grandparents that I, I knew who came to Israel, they were also very active in their synagogue. They were religious. My parents, grandparents that perished in the Holocaust were also, this was the generation that was really traditional Jewish Orthodox. M my parents were already the new generation of people who came to this country, different, of course. And uh, this is really my personal now the background. Now to the question if they influence, yes, a lot. But I don't think they, they imagined that I will have to do with law. My mother was very famous in the education field very important, very influential in in this field. And I thought that this is what I will do. But uh, somehow I thought it will be interesting to see what law means. And when I entered I, this field, I stayed there, as you know, until today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I went to the Hebrew U. This is where I had my, my studies, my law, my law school. And, and what, what led you to the study of law? I, I, I really don't know. The truth is that I didn't believe what I know today, the importance of law in our social life, in our political life. I didn't even know. I was just curious to know something different. I thought that I'm going to study literature, history, and then I said, well, let's do something different. And this was the law school. And I fell into it and I fell in love with this uh, profession, of course. Can you hear me? Yes, I hope I can be heard. Um, okay. So after military service and when you became an officer, you then went to the Hebrew University. And yes. were you influenced by any particular teachers there? Well, my teacher was at that time uh, Aaron Barak who became later, of course, the most famous jurist in Israel, and not only in Israel. He was my teacher from the first year in law school, very influential. Well, you know, he influenced the law in Israel until today. He was really, and he was the attorney general that I worked with as a state attorney later, and he was my, of course, uh, president when I came to the court. And he was very influential, uh, of course, in my legal education. So th then you spent the rest of your career in, in public service, in law. And you, in, yeah, and you were in the state attorney's office, and eventually you became the state attorney, which I said was equivalent to a director of public prosecutions. Uh, and you dealt with some extremely high profile and delicate cases. Uh, can you tell us something about some of the most important ones? Yes, just to say a few words, what is the uh, state attorney in Israel? We have the head of the hierarchy is the attorney general, number one in the legal hierarchy in the Ministry of Justice. Not like in the UK, he is not a political figure, he is not a member of the cabinet, he, is not, he should be an independent public service highest official. And number two is the state attorney, always working together with the attorney general. But the state attorney is responsible for all the litigation in the state, not only criminal, it's not only like the DPP, the whole administration with thousands of uh, thousands, uh, attorneys, civil and the, and the criminal, of course, and constitutional lawyers, they all serve under in charge is the uh, deputy, is the is the state attorney. And this is what I did there. Now, did you ask about special cases? Uh, yes, there were many. First of all, I must say I was 
serving in the Ministry of Justice in all those. I started as a, an assistant to the state attorney and I remained there. I stayed for 28 years, almost 30 years. So I, I had all kind of professional experience that we had there, appearing in court, appearing in Supreme Court a lot, representing the state, and not only in the Supreme Court, and the policy of the state attorney's office. All this was, of course, part of my my work. I had a few fields that I paid more attention to, and I thought they are the most important. So part of it was, uh, of course, crime. We all, when we are, when we represent the state, we're in charge of criminal prosecution, corruption and corruption in institutions of government was one of my um, uh, goals. Uh, military, we have a very, very special situation with the territories that we keep, where it's held and occupied and, and uh, administered by the army. Now they all have to, of course, keep the rule of law, which is not so simple in the very complicated situation. So I represented them in court, in high court, when there were petitions against them, but we also advised them and guidelines for them, and we were very much involved in the work of the military. A special cases we had, I, I, you know, those were the, all our missions that I took uh, personally part in were very difficult. Rabbi Kahana against Rabbi Kahana, the Jewish underground, which in 84 was uh, just uh, uh, revealed and we knew that we have a Jewish underground and we prosecuted them. It was a very difficult case with a lot of people against the prosecution, of course. It caused a lot of problems in public and this was a very serious case that we actually defined a Jewish group as terrorist, which isn't easy at all. And this was one of the things we did as a prosecution. I had so many problems. Many times when you're in this office, you have tension between the government, the executive, and the prosecutors and the public officials that work for the government like the Attorney General and the State Attorney. As you know, it happens everywhere. We had few clashes very serious like that. And sometimes I was a troublemaker, uh, I can tell you. Uh, when I refused to represent the government in, on the deportation of 400 people that were uh, ex uh, not extradited but deported from Israel, and I thought because of they were suspected as Hamas people. When they came back, they were Hamas people, all of them. At the beginning, they were suspected as Hamas people, and they were sent to Lebanon. And I thought it's against all the rules of the Supreme Court, so I refused to represent at that time Rabin and the government. It was a big scandal. I had a few scandals like that too, which is known as another one was Bus 300, where a it was a, this was a traumatic thing, really, for earthquake, for the security service, for the legal service, when we found out that a terrorist that uh, kidnapped a bus, a civil bus, and were brought down from the bus and were killed, and then it, after two years of cover-up, we found that it was done by people from the security service. I was the one that got the information, and then we tried, and we had a fight with Prime Minister at that time, Paris, with the heads of the security service, so that people were responsible for what happened when they had them in their hands and interrogated them, and somehow they they <laughs> they killed them. This was a big fight that we have against all the cabinet members and. So sometimes, and the Prime Minister, sometimes, usually during 30 years 
almost 30 years, as I said, I only represented the government. But there were situations, not easy ones, when the tension was when we said that the rule of law and, the, and keeping the law and human rights puts us and puts upon us a duty to, to work, to, to promote those values, even against government uh, intentions and policy. This wasn't easy. Those were the days. Um, I was so, some, uh, yes. Was there sometimes pressure from the press on you to uh, to take a different line? Of course. You see, the truth is sometimes the pressure was on the Attorney General. I didn't take it seri seriously. I mean, pressure is 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 when you know that you do the right thing. You cannot do it. Not every day. Not every year, even. But when you are sure that this is the right line to perform your duties, then I don't know any pressure. Politicians didn't dare at that time, not on me. Uh, today they do, but it wasn't like that. I mean, they, they were very angry and they were against me and there were a lot of the talk, but nothing. Uh, this happened before I was the state attorney. And this was one of the reasons that it wasn't easy to be to come the, uh, to have this job of a state uh, attorney, because people remembered also some of the fights that we had, uh, especially with certain groups, as I said, the Jewish underground and the bus uh, case uh, against the security service. The end was that the head of the security service couldn't stay in office anymore. So this was a but. The feeling is that we did something that changed the whole culture, culture that sometimes in many secret services and, and uh, this kind of uh, entities, culture sometimes of not telling the truth, of, of cover up. I think this was a very big change after what we did on that issue. So life in, you see, when you're a state attorney or attorney general, every day you have another story. It's your initiative to decide if there is what to investigate, if you have to take a police investigation or not. In the court, you're passive until the case comes to you. In life, everyday life of the state attorney, you take the cases to find out what's happening. This is part of your job. So it's a different thing. And you were also involved in the Kahan Commission on the Sabra yes. and Shatila massacre. Yes, yes, yes. Also, yes, the massacre in Sabra and Shatila. I mean, all those difficult jobs were part, but when you serve so many years and you want to be true with your values, with your really your job, your real mission to protect values, and I think we did a lot on that. Uh, also in the Khan Commission, this is true, uh, with investigating the Sabah and Shatila. See, it's the first time that I interviewed about 200 officers from the army that served in Lebanon. And this is a shock when you see what in the field, what happens. Again, I think it was very important and a big change in the way uh, they, uh, we changed the, uh, the patterns and, and the way they, they work. And this was very important. And also you were involved in the, some of the corruption cases at that time as well. Yes, yes today. Uh, I'm sorry to say that today people are not very much impressed by corruption cases. They got used to it. But at that time, it was a very big scandal. And again, Prime Minister wants his coalition. He doesn't want us to make any waves against his ministers. So the corruption cases weren't easy at all, at all. And you have to, to be, uh, not to give up when you are sure, of course, that you have the right case of bribery or any other corruption case. With this, I also, I mean, during the years, <laughs> I also had some normal cases, criminal, civil, representing the government in the High Court of Justice. Most of them were this kind of things, especially uh, cases against the military in the territories. We represented the government, the military, the army. 
But during the years, we had some stories that uh, weren't very easy. And then you have to take a decision when you, why are we there in the public service? We are not there, not for, not for money, not for uh, fame. We are there to be the gatekeepers. And if we cannot make it, we cannot fulfill our mission. So this was the way we saw it. Me and my colleagues in the state attorney's office and the attorney general at that time. So does that mean that there has to be a real culture of independence? Because in, in a small country like Israel, all the elites know each other, so everybody knows everybody else. It means yes. that you have to be independent, but the whole culture of your office has to be independent. This is, is true. Right? This, this is right. This is true. The independence is essential. You have to be ready to do the work and, and not to take into consideration political changes. You know, one of the things that I always say, they, they people sometimes, populists, like to label those are leftists, those belong to the right. No. In those years, I served, I think, governments of right and left. I was working with Prime Minister Begin's government, with Prime Minister Rabin's government, Paris, all of them. I said public service means we are not, it's not the United States, we are not elected, we are not working with a certain party. We do our professional work, and there is a price for that. But I think this is the core of the thing, to be independent. Unfortunately, today, there is a lot of tension between the prime minister and the attorney general, because the attorney general took the move to indict the prime minister, which is very difficult. He worked with him for many years. He was his uh, cabinet secretary. And yet, and he, he, with his ideas, I think people can say he belongs to the right. Yet he took the independent move of having an indictment against the prime minister, which is a very brave move. And now he suffers a lot because of the politicians are became against the government, against the attorney general, against the minister of justice. Those are things that I had during the years. It's not easy. It's not easy. But this is the role of an attorney general and a state attorney. So this is what I can tell you. You had, you had the strength to bear that. Yeah. It's, it, it, it wasn't easy. But I, I was so sure. You cannot do it if you don't believe that this is important, that this is the core of your office. This is the role that you have to play in, in this. And I must say that it's not only me personal. The people who worked in our teams are really very dedicated, very, very, you know, honest. And I, I hear now politicians say, well, they wanted a political move. They wanted to remove the prime minister. It hurts me because I know how difficult it is to do it, but sometimes you know you have no choice, you have to do it. So this is the situation, it was like that then, and it's just getting worse today. Part of our reality, part of reality. Um, okay, so can we now turn to the, uh, the Supreme Court? Now, most people listening will know that normally a Supreme Court uh, is an appeal court, here's very, very few cases, uh, but I know the, the Supreme Court of Israel is not like an ordinary Supreme Court, and here's a vast number of cases, and everybody is incredibly overworked. Can you, can you explain to our audience why that is? Well, I think I'm talking to the, uh, to the people that I can blame about it. It remains in the British man that the, this, <laughs> this way, that the courts are uh, constituted. Uh, the problem is like that. We had since when the state was established, three layers of courts, the magistrate court, the district court, which was the trial court, and the, uh, the Supreme Court. High Court of Justice is part of the Supreme Court. It's actually in the Supreme Court. This is judicial review on administration, and now, and I'll explain why, also 
uh, constitutional review. So uh, we changed a lot since 1948, of course, the independence of the state and the court, many changes, but remained, the, the, the basis of this remained that people can have access to the High Court of Justice, the Supreme Court sitting as a High Court of Justice directly as first and last instance. This remained from the British. They didn't want other courts, local courts, to, to, to review the government action. And we couldn't change everything. We changed a lot, but still this is part of why the court is overloaded. This is also the court of appeal in criminal and civil cases. So the court has thousands of cases a year. Not like Supreme Court in every country that we know, in the States, in Canada, in Britain. We have thousands of cases. We sit in panels of three, and only when we have very important cases, constitutional cases, then the court may enlarge the panel to nine or 11 or seven, it depends. This is a decision of the president of the court. Now, uh, I, I mentioned a few times the constitutional cases, so I want to comment something about constitution in Israel. When the State of Israel was founded, there was an obligation by the United Nations for the founders to have a constitution, but they didn't manage to constitute a constitution for many reasons. The founder, Ben-Gurion, didn't want it. First, he said, if it's good in a democracy like Britain, it would be good for us too, to be without a constitution. There are, of course, other reasons. Religion and state, which is a serious problem in Israel, and I'll come to it, was then too. Religious parties take part in the coalitions. They are part of government. They are members of the Knesset, our parliament. And they would never accept a constitution, which is not a religious one. They didn't accept it. So the decision of our Knesset was that we'll have basic laws, which will be chapters of a constitution, one chapter after the other. Since 1958, we had different basic laws. All are the, uh, the construction of, of, of the regime, Knesset, judiciary, president, those are the basic laws. Only in 1992, the Knesset had legislated a, what you have in a, in a way in a Civil Rights Act, a, a human dignity and a, human rights and dignity. This is the legislation since 1992. And since then, the Knesset saw it as a constitutional revolution, which gives the court the power to review unconstitutional cases that are not in compliance with a, with a basic law. Since then, there is a lot of tension between the court and the executive and the Knesset, because they said the, the court took jurisdiction that the Knesset didn't give them. Of course, I don't accept their interpretation. It's politically, and uh, this is part of a lot of tension between the court and the Knesset. Uh, sometimes the court is the one to protect the Knesset from the power of the government that has the coalition and has the power on the Knesset too. But this is part of the background. You are right to say that in Israel, the court is very influential. Maybe as you say, more than in other countries that we know, because uh, everything comes to the Supreme Court directly if it's a judicial review case and because uh, people have access to the court and everyone can have access to the court if he has the right case. Our courts do not demand the right of standing and basically we don't accept that the argument of non-justiciability which means, which means that you can bring a case, of course this doesn't mean the court will interfere, just for review, but the court has the power to review if there is a case for that. So uh, 
This is part of why the court is so strong. Not anymore. I mean, the court is strong, but there is a lot of opposition of politicians against the court now. Not only in Israel, but also especially in Israel. Um, for, for those in the audience who, who are not lawyers, I'll, I'll just say that I, the views differ. What I mean by justiciability is, is whether, whether a court will refuse to interfere with something because it's a politi purely political matter. And um, political. there are very few cases, both in England and in Israel, where the courts will, will refuse. In America, it's more, more frequent. What I wanted to ask you is really, uh, the, um, I've read many of your judgments because there's a, yes. a website in which most of the important ones are translated into English. Yes. And if many is, uh, Supreme Court judgments have been cited in, in English cases. I've found at least 30 or 40, and there are probably more. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, is uh, something about the work of the court uh, in the specific Israeli context. And my first uh, uh, area is the question of, of terrorism and what the, how the court balances the rights of individuals uh, in the war against terrorism. And I was thinking of, firstly, targeted killings, and then question of, of uh, detention without trial and so on. Yes, what is yes, your yes. view on how the court does balance human yes, rights? I'll, I'll, I'll refer to it. I'll refer to it immediately. I just wanted to say, because you mentioned that our judgments are cited in your court, in, the, in other courts, I want to say first that we have very, and you know that personally, very good relations with the uh, UK Supreme Court before it was Supreme Court in the House of Lords and with the Supreme Court later. For years, for years, we hold an exchange between delegations from both courts. We know each other's judgment and with a lot of respect. And we took many things from your system, as I said, this is how it started. But the court was new when it was established and could go further more, more than using precedents of years. So it was a modern court and without a constitution, many of the human rights, civil rights were introduced by the court and not by legislation. Now, of course, we, have, uh, we had to strike a balance between human rights and uh, the war against terror. Unfortunately, as you know, Israel was the first to have to confront the actually terrible acts of terror. Before the world knew about it, then it became a problem of all the world that we know, all the Western liberal countries fight terror now and since then, since 9-11, but we were there, unfortunately, before. And it is very difficult because the worst time that we had on that issue, on those cases, was when we had what we call the Second Intifada between 2003, 2002, and later, few years, where buses exploded in Jerusalem, where you couldn't enter a restaurant or cafe in Jerusalem or in, in Tel Aviv because it was so dangerous, the terror acts were terribly. And while fighting terror, the court, everything came to the court. Many cases came to the court, and the court had to take the decision to put the limits of using force against who we can use and, and how to balance, as I said, between terror activities and, and rights. To that, you have to add the special situation that I mentioned already. We keep more than 50 years territories under military regime, administrative, uh, uh, the military administration. But people from the territories can come to the Supreme Court of Israel with no limits. They can come and bring the petitions because the rights, they claim that the rights are infringed and they are many times you need it when you fight the So those cases came to the court, many, in many of our decisions. I think that we were the first to deal with all those issues. Later on, when the world <laughs> found that it happens there too, it, takes, it took a lot of time that Canada, the States, 
the new courts in the UK had to, to deal with cases which are part of the fight against terror. But as I said, we had hundreds of cases like that. And when you sit in the midst of this fight, it's not Afghanistan, it's not somewhere in Iraq, it's at home. This is very, very difficult. Targeted killing was really one of the first cases that the Israeli Supreme Court felt, and I think Aaron Barak wrote a very important decision. I also concurred and wrote. And, and we gave the conditions and the limits, what you can do and you cannot do. Now, again, all the world, the practice of targeted killing instead of bombing a, a population, a huge population, is now used in many parts of the fight against terror. But what can you do and what you are not allowed to do, we gave guidelines in our judgment, which was at the beginning, everyone cited it. I hope they interpret it through right. Yes, and there are many cases. There were a case about having a human shield, which is against international law, putting a, a, a local a resident in front of the unit when you go to to search for terrorists, and we banned it. We said it's not allowed. This wasn't easy at all. Some people didn't understand it. NYU, our students didn't understand what is so difficult about it. It's difficult because then you endanger your own soldiers. It's very difficult to, to take this decision. But this was our decision. You cannot do it. It's against international law. And you cannot use the population against their own population. So those were very difficult cases, very. But as you said, we had to strike the balance. And you've had uh, many cases on the security fence as well, haven't you? Many, many. Uh, we had uh, so many. When there was a decision to uh, build the security fence, it was in a time, again, when those terrorist acts uh, uh, were very, very uh, everywhere. Uh, and and they, they came with vans and, and cars inside Israel and exploded. There were also suicide bombers. So part of it was the decision, which was a decision of the government, of the military, to build this fence. At that time, we were convinced that the military generals came to the court to explain why it is needed. But in all those cases, our, our decisions were that you have to take proportionately land, not to take it only when it is really needed and vital, because you heard the, 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 the population there, it's their, it's their work, it's their land, it's their agricultural life. So where to put a fence? We went, we were sitting at that time, I can't believe it today, with uh, aerial photos and maps to see every point and act, uh, asking for explanations from the generals. Why do you put the fence here and not there? You have to be proportionate with the military need, with the public interest and the private rights of the people. This was really, again, a difficult time. Uh, it was very hard. And now, the problems are different. The, the other area I wanted to explore with you before we ask for questions is, is the other unique aspect of, of Israel, which is the potential divisions between religious and non-religious, um, Ashkenazi and Sephardi, uh, Israelis, Arab Israelis, and you've had many cases which deal with that, including yes. military yes. service and discrimination and so on. Yes. How do you're right. Operate in this area. You're right. <laughs> this is uh, on a daily basis almost. You see, we are a very complex society, divided, complex, ideological groups, religious and uh, and secular. As you said, different people who think that they are in the periphery, not enough privileged. Everything. You have all kind of. Uh, of groups here, which is not easy. The main thing is that in the legislation of 1992, the basic law of human rights and dignity, 
opens with a, a paragraph that says that it's to protect the Jewish and democratic nature of the state. And there is no consensus in Israel until today what is a Jewish and democratic uh, uh, principles of, of, that we have to protect for the state. The court, since this legislation, had to interpret what it means case by case. Now, if you're talking about a Jewish state, religious people believe that it should be halakha state, that it should be the religious law, some more, some less. This is not what the court does. But the court decided it means the, the culture, the language, the, 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 uh, all those things that are symbols of a Jewish state, and this should be kept. The idea is really the idea of the basic document of the establishment of the state, the Declaration of Independence. It's a homeland for the Jews. This is what was said when the state was established. This is the first and main thing. But in the same document, it was also declared that this will be democratic because it will give all the rights, equal rights to all the citizens, the population uh, without any discrimination, not of uh, religion, not of uh, uh, gender, and of course, uh, so, and the, the, the state has to protect all its people, all its citizens. So the question is, is there a contradiction between democratic state and Jewish state? The court tries to harmonize, say there is no contradiction. You have to interpret because the Jewish principles are not different from democratic principles if you talk about uh, about equality, equity, equity for people. And we try to balance and to harmonize between those two principles. This is the main problem in many cases, many cases that come for the, all the different uh, groups and sectors in, in Judaism, that they reform Jews or conservative or orthodox. Uh, all those groups, do we allocate money, subsidies, Core, uh, core uh, studies, all these came to the Supreme Court, all of them. And there are so many problems, and we try to harmonize. Of course, not everyone is happy about it. Uh, settlers think that the court belongs to the left. Others think that it's too much to the right. I believe that the court shouldn't be political, it's not left and not right, but to really give, to express the norms that we all have to share, the basic norms that we share. So you're right with the Haredi uh, uh, question of serving in the military, in the army. It's a very serious debate since the early 70s in the court. And you see the development, the social developments that are reflected in, in, in the court. In 1970, in the early 70s, was the first case claiming that Haredic students should, yeshiva boys, should serve in the military. At that time, it was a small group, it was a matter of coalition, and the court said, well, you don't have the right of standing, you have to prove that you serve more than others to the petitioner, because they do not serve, and denied the case. Year, every few years, we had again the case, and the situation changed. After the government of Begin, thousands were exempted from service, and then the court said it became the quantity became a matter of quality. You cannot; it's really uh, infringing the the principle of equality. And then the court decided to give an opportunity to find a solution, and they still look for a solution in many judgments and the Knesset how to legislate because they refuse to serve many of them in the military. So this is one of the issues and not solved until today. A lot of developments, but not. The court reflects the changes in society always. This is part, it, it's part of life. The problems that come change and the solution change. And this is part of the issues that we do have to deal with.
in the last case, again, the court gave the Knesset an opportunity to legislate what will be the, the duty of the religious yeshiva boys to serve and who will serve and how. They didn't come to a solution until now. This is the situation. I, I, have, I, I have many, many more questions, but I think uh, it's now time. Thank you for, so much for those extremely illuminating answers. I think it's now time to turn it back to Shloma for, um, for any questions we have from the audience. Thank you so, so much. We have, we have a number of questions, and, and the first one is going to be a really easy one for you. Yes. Um, it's um, uh, the question of why did Israel have a woman prime minister, DPP, and president of the Supreme Court before the United Kingdom? Ah, this is for you to answer, <laughs> I can't answer. I very much admire him. You know, I remember when I came to, to the UK asking, why do we have so, so few women in the court? It, when I came for the first time, it was very rare until Brenda made it to the president. It's a, and yet in Israel too, we didn't make it all the way. There is a lot to do to bring equality to women here too, here too. There's another question, Dorit. Um, has um, it ever been canvassed in Israel to have trials by jury? No, uh, I must say I'm happy that we don't have trials by jury. I believe more in the professionals, but it's a, again an historical story. As I said, this is the heritage that we got. You know where the British ruled the idea of jury is part of the system, of the democratic system, of your system and uh, in the United States. But countries that were governed by the British, they didn't trust the, the local inhabitants to be jury. It wasn't the question of equality of the citizens. And it remained like that. The courts were without juries, really for this historical reason. They didn't put juries. There was then a problem of Arabs and Jews and all the kind of problems of ruling this, this it was, uh, this mandatory land was a settlement, actually, and they didn't introduce jury. And when the state was established, we followed the professional courts and we didn't establish it. It's part of a, I don't know, it's a tradition of democracy in those countries that I mentioned, but not here. I, so thought the reason, I thought the reason was because you could never get 12 Jews to agree with each other. I agree that this is also a good reason. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> But really, it has an historical background. There's a question about whether, um, as a result of a state of emergency powers, um, could those powers be used by the government against the courts in, a time, in times of crisis? Where, where's the balance of power, ultimately, when the chips are down? I believe, and I want to believe, that this will never happen. Because, in my view, if this happens, this is really the end of democracy. The whole idea is that the court is independent in times of emergency. Actually, all the years of the state of Israel is legally a state of emergency all the time, according to the law, but you have to renew it. If the government, the, the executive will use uh, emergency rules against the courts or to limit the court. I, I, I will not be surprised if they would love to do that, but this is really impossible. This is going to the roots of our democracy. So I hope this will not happen and I don't believe it can happen. Uh, another question, Dorit, is that you alluded before to the relationship that you have with English <coughs> courts and of course some of uh, the Israeli law uh, will draw its draw its as a result of the British mandate uh, will have roots in in English law. Uh, the question uh, from one of our viewers is: um, Does does there is there a feeling that sometimes Israeli law is hampered by um, its association and its roots in English law? If you were to slough off some of the some of the English law, could you have a better a better legal system? I For, think. Uh, I, I understand. 
I said it, uh, it it's, it's not anymore. I mean, practically, there is a lot of Israeli legislation year after year since the state was established. They disconnected formally from the, from the, we had, uh, the, the penal law was actually from 1936, was British, it was changed. The law of so uh, associations, all those, everything was changed. And actually, when the state was established, we had a special paragraph that when there is a lacuna and we don't know what to do, we refer during, there was a, in the, how do you call it, in the king's order, a, a special paragraph that you have to look what is the situation in England. Not anymore. In the early 50s, even the earlier, it was abolished. Actually, it's not, and more than that, as I said, we were not bound by many historical problems, uh, rates, institutions that were in the tradition of the British. So this is not, does not exist. We went much further earlier. And I think your courts went also early. What I mentioned that remained is part of the structure of the courts, which means three layers of structure, which was since that time. But actually, we share the same norms. And sometimes courts have the same problems, so they can see from each other to learn from each other. When, but this is not because we are bound by it, not because it's obligatory, it just because there is always, especially today, with the good relations and connections between courts, not only the British, especially British. So we, we are sometimes influenced, but not anymore. Uh, it's, it's not binding at all, at all. Thank so you. A question has just come in, Dorit. Um, both you and, and Lawrence alluded to some of the tensions between re religious and secular, and of course, Alongside the secular courts in Israel, you have the religious courts, which deal, which have a certain amount of power, certainly over matters relating to uh, to people's lives and regard to marriage and and, and other family things. law. Yes, yes. family law, and they're very, very influ influential. The question from one of our viewers is: Does the Supreme Court exercise? Uh, any um, power over the religious courts? Can it, for example, remedy a ruling which has been passed by the religious courts based on uh, on, gen on a gender basis? In other words, if there was bias in the religious courts, can you overrule that? What's the relationship yes. between the civil and the religious courts? Yes. The Supreme Court has the power of review on different, uh, you know, court, administrative court, and also the rabbinic. Rabbinic jurisdiction is only diver divorce and marriage. And more and more we can, and we try, and the court always did, to give remedies, as you said, based on gender uh, um, discrimination. We can, we do. The thing is, in substance, the substance of the law is, is uh, the uh, religious law. But procedure, things that have to do with basic values, this we can review and we do. So there are cases that are really brought by one of the parties and the court exercises review. We do. I think it should be more, but we do. And uh, it, it, sometimes it's, it's really vital to, to protect, to protect women, to protect the procedures that are really uh, old, very old, and, and not equality, without equality. So the court exercises review very carefully, very delicate is this, this, this issue, but we do. Yes. So a final question that we have uh, from amongst our, our viewers at any rate is um, around some of the, the complexity, the overall complexity of the Israeli system, uh, the political structure in terms of, of uh, party elections, uh, the role of the courts, the executive, the kind of checks and balances there are between them. Is it your feeling that Israel, Israel's democracy, the one that you alluded to as being part of the very um, uh, document of its uh, founding document, um, that the democracy in Israel is as sound, if not more sound, than democracies that are, that other Western countries strive for? Well, this is a difficult question. I cannot talk about other Western countries. I think we are 
on the edge of a crisis, not in Israel, but in Western countries, as we know enough examples, the democracy is in kind of a danger. I hope not serious, but it's at the edge of it. And I don't want to bring examples from other countries. In spite of all the criticism and what we have against, I mean, from different people and even from the government against the law enforcement and against the court, I believe that we are sound enough, strong enough, and that this, our democracy, will remain sound. But I, I, I think that all of us, all the courts that I know, Supreme Courts and court systems in Western liberal countries have to be on the alert because the tension and the interest of politicians are sometimes to take more power. Many of the achievements that the world had after World War II are becoming too weak today. And, and this is frightening. I don't have to mention Poland and Hungary, and I don't want to say more friendly countries that we know. So this is where I think we have to be all, all the low legal uh, people who are fighting for it to keep the democracy. And I believe democracy is strong. This is in our nature, this is in our education. And if Lawrence mentioned that I was at NYU, I was also a little, uh, I gave a lecture in, in Tel Aviv University, in Jerusalem University. The most important thing, in my view, is to give the education for democracy to the young generation. This is, I think, the most important mission to all of us if we want really to live in a better and a just world. And I believe in it deeply. This is what Thank I can you, say. Thank you so much, uh, Lawrence and Dorit. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time for this uh, conversation, this very fascinating conversation. Can I invite each of you, starting with you, Lawrence, uh, to be able to say good night to our audience and any final words that you would like to say either to Dorit or to our audience before we sign off. And then after that, Well, thank you all. All I can say, it's been, been an honor and a privilege to be, have been talking to Dorit in this context. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Dorit, a final word for you? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you for the audience that was listening to us. I didn't see them, but they could hear. Thank you. Uh, for taking part with me in this conversation. Good night and all the best. And today we have to add also a lot of help to everybody. Yes, this indeed. And by the way, we've just had one final question. And this last question is the most important of all. Can we please have a round two to this conversation? People would like to hear more. We have to wait for another time. <laughs> so finally, Thank you. Thank you and good and night. Thank you. From me and from Rabbi Eli, who has uh, been behind the scenes producing this program, uh, we'd like to say to, to both you uh, and, and Lawrence, Chazak, Chazak, Vimit Chazek, may you continue to be strong in your principles, in your inspiration for all that you offer, both of you to us in your, effect, in your respective fields, uh, for your eminence, for your clarity of thought, uh, and for upholding the very important uh, concept notion so important in our days of democracy and of equality and of human rights. So thank you for joining us tonight and thank you to all of our audience for joining us as well. And we look forward, please God, to other occasions when we should be together always in good health and good night. Thank you and Isha to you. Bye. Good night to you all. Good night, good night.